everyone. Um, so the issue of climate change is kind of difficult to get your head around because it's a global issue. It can seem really abstract and distant, kind of overwhelming, com complex. It's also been a highly politicized issue and, and there's been a lot of confusing information and frankly misinformation out there. So it's really difficult to figure out what's true and what makes sense is sensible and what isn't. Uh, so my intent tonight is really to bring the issue of climate change home to our local area. First, by briefly reviewing the climate change uh, that's already happened in our area over the last hundred years or so, and then provide some concrete examples of natural resources impacted by climate change, specifically hemlock forests and cold water streams. And I, I kind of summarize that as saying brook trout, but there's more to it than brook trout. Um, so as you can see on the slide, I'm giving this talk, but there's, this is work that's been done over more than 20 years. Um, by involving many different agencies and organizations. So I'm just the, the mouth here tonight, really. Um, but before, before I get started, I'll, I'll uh, show you some quotes from the Trump administration's fourth national climate assessment report in 2018. So from that report from the Trump administration, it says, quote, the evidence of human caused climate change is overwhelming. The impacts of climate change are intensifying. Threats to Americans' physical, social, and economic well-being are rising. And how much the impacts will intensify depends on actions taken. And mitigation and adaptation efforts so far do not yet approach the scale necessary. So with that, I'm going to quickly uh, go over some um, studies that were done of the local climate in our area. This first one uh, was a study by National Park Service scientists looking at each park, including the Upper Delaware. And their conclusion was that Upper Delaware River region is becoming warmer and wetter. And they concluded that recent climatic conditions are already shifting beyond the historical range of variability. In particular, um, the precipitation is becoming more extreme. Uh, another study, I guess you could call it a study, uh, the Park Service has these monitoring groups called, and ours that monitors our parks, the Delaware Water Gap and the Upper Delaware is called the Eastern Rivers and Mountains Network. And every year they uh, track the weather of each year not to be confused with climate, they track, the, they summarize the weather for each year by month, what the average temperature is, what the total precipitation is each month, and how that departs from average. And they also look over about a hundred year period from roughly 1900 to, you know, the current year. So over that time period, they also conclude the Upper Delaware is becoming warmer and wetter. And that over that period, temperature has increased roughly 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit and precipitation has increased by about five and a half inches over roughly 100, 120 years. Finally, um, Delaware Water Gap has a special project and, and we had uh, the climate change expert in the Park Service come to our park and do a climate change assessment specifically for Delaware Water Gap and specifically for um, what I call the wa what's called the Watergate Recreation Site. And very similarly, he also concluded this area, uh, Delaware Water Gap, is also becoming warmer and wetter between the period, 60 year period between 1950 and 2010. Similarly, over that 60 year period, temperature increased about two degrees Fahrenheit. And there was a pattern of increasing precipitation, more extreme precipitation and more floods happening. So with that, I'm going to move on to um, the hemlock. So 
a little bit about eastern hemlock. It's considered a foundation species. That mean it means it um, it kind of provides the template uh, and kind of controls the whole environment by creating a microclimate uh, in stands where it's dominant. That's that's what a foundation species is uh, in this case. It's extremely shade tolerant and creates extreme dark shade. Uh, can be extremely long lived, up to 850 years old. Some people call it the redwood of the east. Uh, it was greatly reduced during the 1800s during uh, when Pennsylvania and this region of the country was the world's tanning industry headquarters. Um, I like to point out that even though every species is unique, some species are more unique than others. Um, and there's really no ecological equivalent for Eastern hemlock in this region. Um, some people asked me when I first started this, how does this compare to uh, the chestnut blight and the loss of chestnuts? And I, I don't wanna minimize the loss of chestnut forests, but the key role of chestnut forests was mainly uh, providing reliable, high quality, mast or nuts for wildlife. And um, the loss of chestnut, as serious as it is, it's kind of been somewhat mitigated by a wide diversity of oaks and uh, hickories that also provide, you know, pretty quality mast or nuts, acorns. So in the case of eastern hemlock, we don't have anything like that. The, the important thing for climate change to note is that eastern hemlock is extremely vulnerable to drought. And it's also vulnerable to being uh, snapped off by wind and uprooted by wind. So in this region, many of you probably are aware we have an invasive species called hemlock bully adelgid. It's from Japan. It's, it's, uh, it is an insect. It's kind of like an aphid. It feeds only on hemlocks. Um, it inserts like a really long stylet. It's almost like a straw that's longer than its body and it inserts that into the base of a needle. And once it does that, it can't move. Uh, it has two generations a year. So it has a high reproductive capacity and populations can explode very quickly. And again, the important thing to note about that relative to this talk is that unlike most insects, hemlock woolly adelgid is actively feeds and grows and actually reproduces in the winter. And the main thing controlling hemlock woolly adelgid populations and its distribution is actually winter kill. So because of that, milder winters result in increased more intense infestations and more spread of hemlock woolly adelgid. So on this slide, I've, I've just showed, taken two expert excerpts from uh, two scientific papers that were published on this issue. Um, I guess on the right-hand side, you can see this is a graph. I don't wanna go into the details here, but basically, the colder it gets, the more mortality you get. So cold, oops, cold winters, uh, when we get cold winter temperatures, that really helps limit hemlock woolly adelgid. So <clears throat> this other study in 20, 2007, I took a quote from there, rising winter temperatures due to climate change are likely to remove the conditions currently limiting the adelgid. And that's, that's the only point I wanna make. So the, the infestations of adelgid are, are linked to climate change. So, and when you get higher infestations, uh, those reduce the growth of Eastern hemlock, eventually leading to the death of the trees. And these are data from our monitoring over the years, basically showing on the bottom here, hemlock woolly adelgid infestation level. So it's greater over here, no, infest no infestation there. 
And this is sort of how much new growth happens on the trees. And you can see as you get more infestation, the potential for new growth rapidly declines and goes to zero, pretty much. So, and that leads to mortality. So this is a summary of our 20 years of monitoring the health of the hemlock trees. We monitored about 800 trees over the 20 years throughout the park. And there's a, there's a range of, of uh, how fast trees die. Again, on this, I say mortality, but on this graph, so it's starting 1993 to 2012, that's 20 years. This is marking survival. So survival's going down, mortality's going up. In Adams Creek here, after the 20 years you're down, you've got more than 60% mortality, less than 40% uh, survival. But there is quite a bit of variability. So what does that look like? This is a picture, I've got a series of pictures here. I'm just gonna kind of zip through to give you an impression of what happens when you get hemlock woolly adelgid combined with climate change and storms. Um, so this is how stands look as they're declining. There's a lot of dead trees. They tend to die from the bottom up and become kind of lollipops like that. That's very characteristic of hemlock woolly adelgid decline. So you go from a relatively healthy stand like this. This is a picture from the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, relatively healthy stand. It supports unique species like um, We've got black, black Bernian warbler here, black-throated green warbler, and blue-headed vireo. And these species are somewhat uh, dependent on hemlock habitat uh, or very exclusively dependent on hemlock habitat. So when you lose those hemlock, uh, you lose those hemlocks, even if they don't die, like in this case, you've lost that habitat for those birds and other species. Eventually you get uh, regeneration, secondary succession, and this is a picture illustrating that. This is from about 2010, but you notice the, the regeneration is all hardwoods. Uh, we usually get a lot of black birch and red maple. Uh, occasionally we get some white pine and including some hemlock, uh, but not a lot of hemlock. That decline tends to, uh, in com combination with high water, we've found results in a lot of widespread stream bank failures. Um, this is just one example in Tom's Creek, which is, uh, used to be a great brook trout stream. It's now a brown trout stream. These are just some examples. This is Raymond Skill uh, Falls visitor use area, a very popular visitor use area that used to be a very dark, dense hemlock stand and declined pretty rapidly in the mid early 2000s to mid 2000s. Uh, this is just another picture of Raymond Skill. This is Child's Park. Um, you can see there, there's a uh, CCC era pavilion there in the background. And if you look carefully, you can see a, a guy up on this dying hemlock tree. We had to cut down about, this photo was taken in 2006. We had to cut down almost 200 hazardous hemlock trees in this site, which again, this site used to be a very dark, dense hemlock stand. This is also Child's Park. This was taken probably around 2003. Um, about 15 years later in the spring of 2018, this is what it looked like. And this was following uh, Nor'easter in this March of 2018. And you can, if you look carefully up here, you can see there's a staircase coming down here. There's actually a bridge under here going over the creek. You can just barely see the creek right there. That's Stingman's Creek. 
This is uh, Dingman's Falls Visitor Center parking lot. Again, same story when I got here. That was a very dense hemlock stand that's now really gone. And this is actually uh, Adams Creek. Again, after the March 2018 storm, you can see the entire riparian area has basically collapsed. Uh, the stream is hard to see, it's buried under all these logs. So obviously there's been, you know, tremendous change in the forest and the stream habitat. So that leads me to the brook trout. So Eastern brook trout, um, kind of like hemlock, very similar to hemlock. And I forgot to point out that Eastern hemlock is the state tree of Pennsylvania and brook trout are the state fish of Pennsylvania. And it turns out they're actually ecologically linked. Uh, from our research, we found that brook trout are much more likely to occur in streams running through hemlock stands than streams running through hardwood stands. So uh, there's, they're coincident that way. But like, like hemlock, we're dealing with currently in, in modern times, just a remnant of what used to be here with brook trout. Um, we've lost a lot of brook trout already uh, in history. And again, the important thing to note, especially in climate change, is that brook trout need cold water. Uh, they like water like 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so cold water. They are also uh, increasingly impacted by non-native brown trout. Uh, and they're also affected by floods and sediment. So in our local region, I thought you might like to see this uh, map of where brook trout occur. Brook trout are in these blue watersheds. And you can see there's, uh, and the brook trout combined with brown trout are the green watersheds. And you can see there's a lot more green than blue, which means, um, well, uh, probably over time, those, many of those streams may become only brown trout streams. So, uh, because of concern about brook trout historically and with climate change, back in 2009, 2010, we worked, started working with the USGS Aquatic Ecology Lab in Leetown, West Virginia, to study 18 watersheds in Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. And the USGS has monitored 107 temperature sites marked by these red dots here. About half of those sites had air temperature monitors associated with them. So they monitored both air and water temperature. And then they sampled fish at 83 sites. So this is just a picture of the temperature logger. This is a nice big wild brook trout that we found there. So how sensitive are streams to air temperatures? Um, back when climate change, in the early days of climate change, people were making dramatic, uh, well, they, the, the easiest thing to do was just assume that stream temperatures would change the same as air temperatures. But we found that in some cases that's true. Like in this case, um, you can see the, the air temperature is in red here stream temperature is in blue. And as the air temperature goes up, the stream temperature goes up. As the air temperature goes down, the stream temperature goes down. So the, the stream just follows the air temperature. And a fancy way to show that is in a regression here. You can quantify that with the regression. But <clears throat> so in this case, this is a very, this stream is very sensitive to air temperature. And in fact, we found that impoundments make streams much more sensitive to air temperature than if there weren't impoundments on the stream. But not all streams are sensitive to air temperature. Some are very uh, independent of air temperature. Like this is an example. Uh, here you've got air temperature 
getting very hot up in the upper 20s. Um, and street temp stream temperature remains pretty constant at a very cold, low level. Um, I think this is a rain event right here. And in fact, so if you look at how air temperature increases, what does the water temperature do with this regression? As the air temperature increases over the summer, and it gets hotter into the, you know, the mid and late summer, the stream actually gets, if anything, a little bit colder because I think you get more groundwater. So groundwater input is very important to maintain resistance to climate change. So you don't want to deplete your groundwater. So let's see. Um, so the USGS kind of took it one step further to do a prediction of how much brook trout habitat we might lose with certain amounts of climate change or increases in air temperature. So currently, Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, about 83% of the stream habitat in the park is thermally suitable for brook trout. Uh, <clears throat> with climate change ranging from well, this is all in degrees C. That's about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. This is about five degrees Fahrenheit. This is about nine degree increase in average temperature Fahrenheit. With, <clears throat> with that, those increases in air temperature, we might expect brook trout habitat in the park to be reduced to anywhere between roughly 48% and 72% of the streams instead of 83%. So I think I'll just, I know this graph is, I'm not even gonna go into that graph. It's kind of hard to explain. So um, I wanted to say a little bit about rusty crayfish because it's a new invasive species. It's spreading into our region. We found it in our park in 2015 in probably, well, the, the, one of the best uh, brook trout and trout streams in the park, and probably one of the best trout streams in Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, in New Jersey. And so we were very concerned about rusty crayfish getting into this stream called Van, Van Campen's Brook. So the native range of this crayfish is, it's actually from the United States. The native range is this light orange here in basically Western Ohio, Indiana, and Northern Kentucky, the Ohio drainage. And this brown or burgundy color, that is where it has spread to. It's spread mostly by people. And you can, you can tell that because it's an aquatic species that shows way up out here, you know, out in Colorado and, Utah and Nevada. <clears throat> these are crazy places. You know the crayfish aren't walking out there. So people are spreading these. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this crayfish has been documented to extirpate, or eliminate native species where it occurs and dramatically alter the food webs where it, where it occurs. And again, the, the important thing for us um, to note with climate change is that this crayfish species really prefers and requires warm water. It's limited by cold water. So it's very similar to Adelgia that way. Both invasive species are limited by cold temperatures. So this is, this is Van Campen's uh, brook going along here. Um, we found, first found invasive rusty crayfish in these ponds in 2015 and also in the stream here. And we've been monitoring this ever since then. And it's been six years now. And rusty crayfish only occurs in this stretch that I've marked here from just barely upstream of these ponds, just downstream, maybe about a mile. Oops. <laughs> and so why is that? Well, we've been monitoring, I guess actually our Eastern Rivers and Mountains Network has been monitoring temperature in the stream 
at these five locations, this is the first number one, two, three, four, five. Rusty crayfish is really abundant between at sites, temperature site three and four. So I'm gonna show you temperatures from these sites and note especially what the temperature, how the temperature is different at sites three and four where rusty crayfish is really super abundant. So sites three and four are this green and purple, oops, which is way up here. So these temperatures, these are average weekly stream temperatures over the course of a summer. This is back in 2014, just for an example. But obviously this is uh, much warmer than the sites both upstream and downstream. And it's right in this area where rusty crayfish are super abundant. And in fact, they don't even occur in this upstream section or in this downstream section. So again, that's an indication that, that warmer temperatures could expand the range of rusty crayfish because cold water has limited it. So in summary, I'll just put some bullets up here. Uh, we can expect increased HWA infestations with milder winters and expansion of hemlock woolly adelgid infestations into new areas. I call it the disintegration of hemlock forest ecosystems, loss of distinctive habitats and microclimates, increased invasive plants in those declining hemlock stands. We've witnessed a lot of that. We lose native biodiversity in both plants, birds, uh, amphibians, aquatic insects. We can expect increased flooding and destabilized stream channels, more sedimentation, decline in loss of wild brook trout populations, increased rusty crayfish populations, and spread of rusty crayfish. And then in the end, I wanted to note again that impoundments warm streams and increase their sensitivity to air temperature. And I mentioned that because um, one possible response here is to remove impoundments wherever possible to maintain cold stream temperatures. And again, groundwater is important to keep streams cool. So with that, um, oh, <clears throat> so I wanted to mention reduced ice fishing opportunities because I like to ice fish. There, look at that monster that guy caught. <clears throat> hopefully you can hopefully you can see this is a joke <laughs> not a real that's, that's a real pickerel but that's not a real man <laughs> thank you rich are you good to take a couple questions oh yeah absolutely awesome. All right. jeff <clears throat> do you want to hopefully there's you questions calling people for questions or does anyone have any questions for rich yeah, I'm just curious, the, the uh, temperature uh, stations, uh, the monitoring, is, is that a local monitoring um, system or regional or how did you arrive at a two degree um, increase in ambient air temperature? Oh, for the, going back to the uh, climate change at the beginning of the talk, those, 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 yeah. are, those are, um, they're compiled data from uh, surrounding county uh, weather stations that are national weather station approved sites. Going back to, again, roughly the year 1900, the period of record. So they're, so they're national weather station approved sites in the surrounding counties for the most part. Uh, the localized relative the, the, the one for Delaware Water Gap is uh, more specific, um, limited to sites right immediately in, well, actually in some cases in the park or adjacent to the park. Uh, but the details, I'd, I'd have to 
get back to you with more details if, you, if, if you're interested. Um, I can provide you with, with the methods of how they, how they got the temperature records. I'd be happy to do you that. You say up in Delaware, you're referencing a water gap, are you not? Uh, no. I, when there's, I, a lot, there's a lot of hemlock groves around here, huge blocks of hemlocks that are not infested. Right. I, so when I, when I was talking about the hemlock decline, that was all the work I did at Delaware Water Gap. Okay. So none of those photos were from the upper Delaware corridor um, where you guys are. But um, it's happened at Delaware Water Gap. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's dramatically impacted the park. Um, I mean, I'm not shy about saying, especially now that I'm retired, I mean, we've, we've failed at our mission. We have not, you know, maintained the resources um, the way the park service is supposed to, but that's not our fault. I mean, we, <laughs> we're pretty powerless to deal with these kinds of things once, once they're underway. I, I didn't have time to go into all the, the ways that we've, uh, potential ways to, to mitigate you know, hemlock woolly adelgid and, and climate change with brook trout. And there are things you can do, but um, they're difficult and they, they have limited uh, effectiveness. Kristen, yeah, Kristen. She's unmuting herself. Yeah. Hi, Hi, I wasn't sure if yeah. you'd seen my hand raised. Uh, thanks, that was really interesting, Rick. Um, I had two questions. First, if, if I missed this, if you would be able to share your PowerPoint, I definitely have some colleagues who would be interested in seeing this as well. Sure, no problem. Thank, thank you. And the second question, again, pardon me if I missed this. Um, you mentioned that the work showed that some streams are more sensitive than others to changes in air temperature. You did um, note that groundwater input seemed to be one of the factors that makes some streams more resilient than others. Yes. Was there other factors that you can identify or that were kind of sussed out in terms of what's different about those streams that are more sensitive than others? Um, the thing that's, the, the, the really two clear signals are groundwater and impoundments. Um, the other factor is actually uh, hemlock cover. So where you have intact hemlock cover, uh, and if you're in a ravine where there's more shade, um, the stream tends to be a little bit less sensitive to air temperature, but that's, it's, that's you know, it's, we can't really separate that out from groundwater very easily. So, um, in fact, we don't, we don't know why. It's very clear that brook trout occur more frequently in streams running through hemlock stands, but we don't really know if that's specifically because of something hemlocks are doing like shading the stream, or if it's because hemlocks like the groundwater and the moist environment, which is also benefits the stream. And I suspect it's, it's both, some combination of both. Thank you. Does the colder water actually kill off the rusted crayfish or does it just limit reproduction? Did, did you hear that, Rich? I didn't hear the first part. Thank you. Does the colder water actually kill off the rusted crayfish or, or does it just limit reproduction? So I, I heard the quest, the part about does it just limit reproduction? Um, or does it kill them off? Uh, so the cold water actually um, can, um, the crayfish don't grow as well in the cold water and the females, their, their reproductive potential is determined by how big they are. So the crayfish in these streams are actually small compared to streams where it's much warmer. And so the reproductive reproductive potential. They, in other words, they have fewer eggs. That's what I should say. They have fewer eggs. 
when the eggs hatch, um, fewer of the young survive because it's not warm for them. And again, they don't grow as well. So uh, there's actually mortality of the young, partly potentially because it's cold, but also because um, they just can't grow and reproduce when it gets too cold. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, yes thank you. I, I do have a question. You mentioned the two degree warming. Um, you would acknowledge that the two degrees is well within the, uh, the expected range of variation from the mean and over a long period of time, right? Uh, no, it's not within the range of means. So, so climate, climate is, I just want to be clear, climate, just to make the definition, climate is average um, conditions of weather. So weather is what you experience when you walk outside. Climate is an average of those things over uh, the typical, the typical period of comparison is like 30 years. So you, you collect temperature data for 30 years and you look at what the average January temperature is or average maximum January temperature or average minimum January temperature, that's climate. And, and when you look at 30 year periods back in the early 1900s and compare them to 30 year periods now, there's a clear difference of about two degrees Fahrenheit. But that's within the normal range over a long period of time. I mean, 30 years is like a dead cat. cat uh, well, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not within the range of, it might be, sure, it's within the range of variability of what's happened to, over the course of Earth's history of, four, you know, 4 billion years, but human beings weren't here, you know, a million years ago. So that's, you know, what it was like a million years ago isn't relevant to me. Yeah, um, what consideration was given to this, any of these studies with the policies of New York City and their reservoirs? Uh, we didn't take any, we weren't thinking about that when we did these studies. To, to be blunt, answer the question. <laughs> their, their policies aren't very well defined as far as below the reservoirs. Right. Um, I mean, they've switched to whole ecosystems from cold water to warm water, which obviously has had effect all the way down the line. Well, that, I can't really address that. I, I don't have the expertise to really address that, especially <laughs> in this context right now, so. Um, yeah, we, we, all the studies we did, we didn't, we weren't looking at if you notice, none of the studies we did were really focused on the main stem. It was all, it was all focused on tributaries and forests um, and, and didn't involve the main stem in this case. So sorry to disappoint you, but we don't, yeah, we don't, I don't have any input on that. Well, I just figured that any study would be incomplete without those considerations because it is a big factor large bodies of water and, and, and they determine what goes down the river yeah well and that's right um but we we didn't look at the river we were looking at again delaware water gap is different than the upper delaware um because the upper delaware is very focused specifically on the river and the immediate river corridor whereas delaware water gap has 70,000 acres of land and probably about 25 pretty significant tributary streams and that we try to manage and protect. So we were really focused on those tributary streams. I, I can understand that because at one time there were a lot of brook trout in the river and you don't see that anymore. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I didn't mention is that um, we did witness that when we get big storms like uh, 2011, I think it was, um, 2011, 2012, <clears throat> we were monitoring streams for brook trout and we got these 
big fall storms and floods. And a couple of our streams that had the highest densities of brook trout in them, um, those floods almost completely, or in one case, completely, as far as we could tell, wiped out the, the brook trout population. Um, <clears throat> the brook trout were literally just blown right out of the stream. Um, and fortunately, um, the brook trout have recolonized that stream, but it takes years for that to happen. So if you get those kinds of storms frequently, you're not gonna have the kind of brook trout populations there because it, it takes a long time for those populations to recover after being you know, really dramatically reduced by these you know, big floods. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a couple um, have you done any um, monitoring of the dissolved oxygen levels in these creeks? Uh, yes, we've done some, yes. And does the reduction in dissolved oxygen correspond to the increase in temperature? Uh, I, I don't think we've, re we haven't really looked at that. The, most of these streams have, have a lot of dissolved oxygen. So dissolved oxygen is not a limiting factor for brook trout or or really just about any organisms in the stream. Um, well, trout require a, a high a, a DO to sustain, yeah. you know. That's so exactly why they thrive in cold water. Um, and the other question. Yeah, that's, the, the, these streams, all these, all these streams have, uh, have plenty of dissolved oxygen, even when they're, even the warmer ones. So the, the other thing is just kind of a point in statistics, if my memory serves me right, a, a 30 sample um, statistical analysis is, is pretty marginal to determine uh, a reliable uh, standard deviation. It, it's not a long, it's not a, a lot of sampling. So, you know, that's why people look for longer periods or longer uh, points, uh, data points to, to, to increase the reliability of, a, of, of you know, your, your statistics. So, um, you know, I'm not doubting what you're saying. It's just that 30 years, I don't think creates a, it is reliable enough to, to institute some kind of policy. You'd want to look at a much longer time period to analyze a, a standard deviation, whether it's one degree, two degrees, five degrees, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out. But um, I kind of remember my statistics class of 30 was on the, the marginal side. I think you needed 30 to even start the study, if I remember right. But well, just, wait. <laughs> well, again, Climatologists use 30 years as a standard uh, assessment measure for climate. So that's a standard method among climatologists. And in my, as I remember statistics, 30, 30 is, a, is a pretty decent sample. Of course, I would say more and more isn't always better because let's just say you had a hundred years. Um, so we would have one data point right now if we were doing 100 years. So we, we, we couldn't detect any change. We could only detect change over 100 year periods, which isn't really relevant to human beings planning. So uh, to me, we have to keep in mind that we're trying to plan on a human scale here. We're not, we're not looking at ancient geological past. We're, we're trying to plan for society, to plan for floods, to plan for well out west, it's fires, um, or along the coast, it's sea level rise. So we need to look over a time horizon, not of, you know, 
just wait another hundred years to see what happens. We have to look at what's, what's coming at us, say the next 20 to 30 years. Well, there's a flaw in that thinking because if natural forces have the same impact prior to man's impact, then that's, you know, that's something that should be evaluated within the context of climate change. So, you know, to, to just look at man's impact on climate versus what the climate's done prior to man's ability to, to impact climate, I don't know. Well, all, all I can say is over that hundred year period, we didn't separate out human beings impact. We just looked at the empirical data and the amount of variability and over those like 30 year periods. So, so the, the amount of variability, what we're seeing now is, is on the extreme end of, for example, the precipitation events we're seeing now are on the extreme end of what has happened over the past 100 years.